showing a slideshow of Just Life. Uh, if you want to view it while everyone is speaking, you can just simply right click on the window um, that has the slideshow and pin it so that it stays as your large screen. Um, or you can continue to have it pinned down to whomever is speaking. I do know we have a lot of good looking people speaking today. Um, okay, so I want to thank everyone for being here today. Uh, I know my uncle had a tremendous impact on most of you here, uh, and so that loss is certainly weighing heavy for a lot of us. However, our family has loved reading the dozens of Facebook posts many of you have made. Um, it has provided much comfort knowing that he meant as much to you, uh, all of you, as he has to us as well. You know, there's never really a way to, to fully quantify just how much of an impact um, you may have or somebody may have on you. Uh, but we like to believe that Jeff uh, was aware of that for himself. So Jeff passed away at 6.35 p.m. on Monday, uh, the 17th of August. Now, typically in a memorial service, this would be the moment where we would observe a moment of silence for the one who had passed. Uh, but we'd like to do something different. What we would like to do is have a moment of the Beatles. Um, so we're going to be playing In My Life, which was actually Jeff and Joanne's wedding song. So let me do that for you right now. Sorry. All right, thank you. Uh, now, before we get to our speakers uh, for the evening, we would just like to, our family would like to take some time and uh, send a thank you to those who were kind enough to send food over the last week. Uh, to Brian and Carolyn's friends, Reed, Rebecca, Josh, Brian, Will, and Connor, um, a thank you. You know, nothing better to distract a morning Jewish family than a bag full of uh, deli meats and bagels. <laughs> Uh, to Joanne and Jeff's friends at the North Broward Democratic Club, uh, thank you. Uh, they provided dinner from Jeff's favorite sushi restaurant. A uh, thank you to Harriet and Ira's cousins, Cynthia, Emily, and Vinny. Uh, those three allowing the family to have their first meal drenched in marinara for three decades uh, due to Jeff's allergies. Um, and finally, a thank you to Harriet and Ira's friends. Simply put, another delicious Italian meal. Um, you know, if someone were to ask me who the smartest person, who I think the smartest person I know is, uh, I would with no hesitation affirm that it was my Uncle Jeff. Uh, to tell you a quick story, uh, in 2012, I briefly moved to Florida with Brian, who was nice enough to let me sleep on his couch. Um, and if you know Brian and I w well enough, within two hours, we already had a dispute, something that we were arguing over. Um, and mind you, this is 2012, and so the both of us had basically an encyclopedia of information in our pockets, yet our first instinct was to call uh, Brian's father, Jeff, uh, because we knew that he was going to have the answer to whatever our dispute was. Um, but if we had ever started talking about something that Jeff wasn't sure of, uh, he was humble enough to say, I don't know. Um, and to me, that's the mark of a, of a real man. Uh, my Uncle Jeff was always authentic. Uh, and I love that I was around him enough for that to for that part of him to influence me. So uh, unfortunately, we did have to limit uh, the speakers today due to the format. Uh, but our family would like to give everyone here an opportunity to share some of those thoughts. I'm sure some of you, many of you, have already done it. Tasha has been putting the link up in the group chat uh, as she will continue to do throughout the service. Uh, it would know it would definitely mean a lot to us if you could just take some time and share a memory or something special about Jeff with us. With that being said, we will have eight speakers tonight. Uh, the first of which is Jeff's best friend and wife of 30 years, my wonderful aunt, Joanne. Hi, I first wanted to say thank you to all of you who posted on Facebook. The beautiful tributes and pictures and words have been wonderful for all of us to see. He knew how most of you felt throughout the years, yet I don't think he completely understood the magnitude of it all. From the day we met, we just knew. 
When he asked me for my phone number, I told him I had a four-year-old daughter. When he and his friend John went home that night, he mumbled over and over again, I can't believe she has a four-year-old daughter. I can't believe she has a four-year-old daughter. <laughs> Our first date was Bob Pat Goldthwaite. Jeff had cuffs on his pants because he didn't get to his mom in time to hem them. But he had a CD player in his car back in 1987, Joe Jackson playing. The CD player beat the cuffs. <laughs> On our maybe fifth date, he brought it to his mother's house to have dinner out of her freezer. And that was also <laughs> the first time I met him. I met them. Um, I knew at that moment he was a bit of a cheapskate. <laughs> <laughs> However, we have two homes on the water, so it was all worth eating the freezer meat. <laughs> um, getting back to Jenny, he just told me again last week how he fell in love with her upon their first meeting. Jeff loved her all these years as a daughter. Stepfather or stepdaughter were not mentioned ever in our home. Then we had Brian. He brought so much to our family and made our family complete. He was a wonderful father to them both. They knew they could talk to him about everything, Brian and Jeff looked so much alike that when we were in China, they accidentally had each other's copies of their passport and the Chinese officials did not even notice. Because of COVID, we were only, be able, we were only able to see him the day they took him off life support. Because of COVID, none of us could be hugged by our friends. Because of COVID, he was in the hospital by himself. No one should have to be alone like he was. And I have to add this for Jeff screw Trump and the way he handled the pandemic. He was torn between journalism and radio at the very beginning of college. Jeff was lucky to be able to do both and do them very well. When iTunes came out, he was like a kid in a candy store. We listened to WLVN, Levine, that's what he called it, and he had amazing playlists. The programmers today would love them. For my birthday this year, he made one specifically for me 358 of my favorite songs. The bond and love we had was so special. He broke his right ankle at the end of January, Valentine's Day, while I was out running errands. He drove with his left foot, so I had flowers that day. It was so generous, but he said he had to do it. During this quarantine, we've been literally three inches away from each other all day, every day. He was so worried I would get the virus. He did everything all the shopping, putting everything away, not letting me push ele button, elevator buttons with my elbows in our building. We became essentially one person, always saying things at the same time or saying something the other was thinking at the same time. After leaving Hartford Current, he started a business thanks to our friend Mark Snyder. He was extremely successful. He worked so hard and had to change himself to be a sales guy. No longer the guy in the background, he became Mr. Pompano. A few years after I was diagnosed with leukemia, he sold his business so we could spend as much to get time together as possible. He became editor-at-large of Pompano Magazine and wrote a humorous informational column every month. Our family will never be the same. I am not the same person I was on Thursday. We did have a really fun day on Thursday, and the last thing I heard was him laughing hysterically at a scene from the office. That's what I will hold on to. He was cremated and will be resting in an Abbey Road urn in my home. When it is my turn to join him, he will be buried with me. I picked in my life for a wedding song. He was thrilled about it being a Beatles song, but it was the perfect song for us. We loved each other so much, and I believe we'll be together again in another life from a Prince song that I made him play all the time because it was about us. I am yours and you are mine and together we'll love through space and time. And I really do believe that. Thank you. Okay, uh, next up we have a lifelong friend of Jess, a man who needs no introduction to this group of people, uh, Mr. Bob Buffman. Thank you. And uh, Joanne, how beautiful. So Joanne used the word generous, and I've always known that Jeff was uh, generous, but this whole thing that happened so suddenly uh, to all of us, uh, and of course to Jeff, um, made me really focus on his generosity. I think, um, well, I think that uh, the Facebook comments that, uh, you know, are in not the dozens, but the hundreds, um, all talked about 
Well, if it was a woman, often, you know, that Jeff worked with, it was, damn it, he made me cry, but uh, he was so generous with his words, actually. Uh, a tremendously, Jeff was never at a loss for words. He would say things uh, uh, um, that, that other people may not uh, say. They may choose to be silent. Jeff was always the guy to speak up. And it influenced so many people. It made him a mentor to so many people. And uh, in reading all the comments, I realized how many people uh, Jeff meant so much to uh, and the life lessons they learned by some of the things that he taught them. So many quotes that Jeff said that people held on to, not for years, but for decades. And heartwarming. Jeff was extremely generous with his time and words and just having an interest in people. I mean, ultimately, you know, if it was a business situation, he wanted the business to do its very best. But to make that happen, the people had to be at their best. And not only did the business benefit, but the people, all of us uh, that he taught, um, benefited greatly and have unbelievable uh, memories. And, um, have, you know, are better people because of it. You know, uh, I, I got to say that um, Jeff and I talked frequently, and he always, always, always talked about his family, always to me. Um, you know, obviously, radio is the easy go-to place. Um, but, um, you know, Jeff, uh, in every conversation, in the last several years, he made mention of uh, of his kids, uh, Brian. Uh, you know how incredibly proud he was. Um, uh, is it Carolyn or Caroline? I'm sorry, I've never met you, but he kept saying how incredible you were uh, uh, as uh, as Brian's partner, um, uh, Jenny. Uh, he always talked about how much he loved you. And, and my God, uh, it's several times uh, a week uh, FaceTiming with your daughter, his granddaughter. Uh, this is all great stuff, and it made me feel so good. You know, Melissa, um, he really, really loved you. And, uh, and always, you know, we would go back and forth about your career, um, you know, get updates on you. And he uh, uh, really cared so deeply. And Joanne, uh, you said it right. And you have Jeff sized up really well, especially with respect to his feelings for you. Um, you called him on Facebook, your soulmate. And there's an absolutely no question in my mind that, that you were his uh, soulmate. Um, uh, he loved you so much and always, always, always included comments about you uh, and, um, and how you were doing and how he wouldn't uh, rather be doing anything else uh, than being with you uh, in the last many, many years. Uh, and obviously more frequently in, in the last several years. So, um, you know, we all love Jeff uh, and uh, we will never forget him ever. Uh, and uh, God bless Jeff Levine. Thank you, Bob. Uh, next up, we have Jeff's daughter, my beautiful cousin, Jenny. <laughs> Dear Dad, thank you for being my dad and never making me feel like your stepdaughter. Thank you for bringing me into your family, which became my family. Although I will never fully be ready to live life without you, 
You have made me be the woman I am today, which as we are all a work in progress, I am stronger now to be there, not only for myself, but for the rest of the family, which I know you would want. Thank you for showing me how to be a good parent, but without us knowing it, you set me up to be a stronger daughter to my mom than I knew I could be, a more compassionate sister to my brother, Brian, and more available and dependable niece to my Aunt Missy. And to be able to be there to help Grandma and Grandpa with their needs. I'm going to finish for Jen, my niece. I can, I can, I can. He taught me to muddle through, like to speak a DJ. Hashtag Team Jenny Sue may have been, I'm talking for Jenny right now, by the way. Hashtag Team Jenny Sue may have been our intro joke, but I am now Team Jenny Sue, which I could not have been without you being my number one fan. And although you will always be my number of fan, number one fan, I work every day to be able to see myself not only the way you saw me, but the way you taught me to be. I'm so sorry for all the time that was wasted, but I promise for the rest of my days, not only to take anything for granted, but to use the gift you not only gave us, but to pass it on to your granddaughter, Juliana. Although your time with Juliana may have been cut short, I'm so glad you were able to show her the love of music, family, and most important of all, the love of life. You will forever not only dance to the happy song, which was a thing, by the way, the happy song. If you're not in music, Google it, it's good. But you will forever more live the happy song. No, there, there was a little more. Um, okay, I'm just gonna, okay. In closing, we we all want to just say words and words and words words. And I was talking to Jenny and saying, Jeff would be like, you don't have to say a seventy-two word break. Like sometimes less is more. <laughs> <laughs> and Jenny was like, is this a? Here's the thing, and here's the and here's the most important thing of the last couple of paragraphs from his daughter to Jeff. Thank you for being my anchor. And I'm gonna hijack this for a second and say thank you for being all of our anchors. That's beautiful, Jenny. It's beautiful. Okay, uh, and now we have another one of Jeff's longtime and dear friends, uh, Mr. Mark Snyder. Mark might be muted still. There we go. Okay. Can you hear me now, guys? Great. I met my wife when I was 20 years old at a family wedding. And that night she told me that her father had died a year earlier at 53. And I remember thinking, good for him. He lived a long life. Because when you're 20, 53 seems like a world away, right? When I turned 40, it hit me that her dad was robbed of a good 25 years or more. And today at 58, I understand that Jeff, also 58, was robbed of a much longer life. I worked in the music business and radio promotion and first met Jeff in the uh, early 90s when he was a program director at WBAB. We didn't get along that well. Uh, I had a lot of music that I thought BAB should be playing, and Jeff and Bob and Ralph felt otherwise. Sometime in 1996, I was working for Elektra Records promoting a song by Metallica, which BAB, much to my surprise, added to their playlist right away. When I spoke to Jeff, I asked him, did you actually listen to the song? He said, should I? I said, 
yes, because quite honestly, uh, I've been listening to BAB since I was a teenager, and I don't think it belongs on your radio station. Jeff said, I'll call you right back, and he hung up. Ten minutes later, he called me back, and he said, that's the most honest thing a promotion person has ever said to me. You're right. We really can't play that song. I should have listened to it. I just assumed it would be for us. And that was the end of my Metallica record getting played on BAB, but it was the beginning of a very long relationship with Jeff and Joanne and his family. And it started with, hey, let's go out for dinner and let's bring the wives this time to, hey, why don't you bring your wife and kids to come see Brian play hockey? to, I want you to meet Jenny, to, I want you to meet my friends, Paul and Carrie Fleischman, and on and on. And we remained friends from BAB to LIR to Newsday to Fort Lauderdale, back north to Hartford. And when he was done with the newspaper business, he called one day and said, so tell me about Maptoons, which is the advertising company I own. Uh, we create the large, colorful town maps uh, you've probably seen. They promote local businesses for the Chamber of Commerce. And I trained Jeff on how to start his own map company and soon South Florida Chamber Maps was born. And through it all, we grew closer and closer. Um, even the miles between us didn't break us apart. We grabbed every opportunity to see each other, whether they were visiting New York to see Jenny and Julia and the Fleischmans or they were going out to Denver to visit Brian and Caroline my wife had family out there, so we'd find a way to hook up. Sadly, we had plans just this past July to meet up for a Texas road trip, but like a lot of other plans, the pandemic put an end to that. But no regrets, no regrets at all. Jeff and I were the closest of friends. We could talk for two minutes, we could talk for 20 minutes. Yes, we could talk for two hours. Just ask Joanne. We talk about music, family, business, politics, and more. We'd never run out of things to say, always ending with, next time, tell me how your boys are doing, or I have to tell you about an idea I have for a radio station. So yes, Jeff Levine was robbed, and Joanne was robbed, and his children, his granddaughter, his sister, his parents, his daughter-in-law, they were all robbed. We were all robbed. And like my wife losing her father when she was 17, life is not fair. And sometimes like now it's downright cruel. There's no explaining it. But like I said, I have no regrets. Uh, Jeff and I shared a full, rewarding, meaningful and lasting friendship. One that I can never replace. And in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Rest in peace, buddy. Thank you, Mark. Now to bat, Brian, uh, Jeff's son, Brian. Hello, everybody. Met hat for my dad. You'll never see me wear another Met hat. <laughs> it was good with my Met tie. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Baseball stats, bizarre headlines, music facts, Trump stupidity, my mom, my life. Those are just a few things we talk about every day that are going to be taking are going to take a while to not want to instinctively text him about. We spent the last 6 months doing everything we can to stay safe from COVID and it hurts to know that I was robbed of two planned trips to see him over these last 6 months. I've read so many stories about the people he had an impact on professionally, how he pushed all of you to be the best that you can be. While it may feel rewarding to have that in a boss, imagine that being your dad as a teenager. <laughs> Needless to say, we did not get along very well when I was a teenager. <laughs> Once I hit a certain age, living in the same home as someone so demanding just became too difficult. But once I went to college, it was like something switched in our relationship. It was easier to lie about my grades <laughs> and, things that I, and things that I was doing so that we could talk less about that kind of stuff and more about baseball and music. 
But then I graduated and I didn't have to lie about my grades anymore. <laughs> and we can just talk about life like two adults. It seemed like the more we began to look like each other, the better we got along. <laughs> In college, I asked him to make me a classic rock playlist for my iPod. He made me two. One of about 400 songs he knew I loved and another of about 250 songs he didn't think I knew but thought I'd enjoy them if I listened to them. Whenever I called with a question about music, it always came with an additional 10 minute music history lesson I didn't ask for. <laughs> I take the phone off my ear, throw my head back in exasperation, <laughs> put my phone back and be like, uh-huh. <laughs> oh yeah, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> I'd do anything for one of those unprompted music lessons right now. The last 10 years or so, we built such a special relationship together. When I wanted to check two stadiums off my baseball bucket list and didn't have any friends who wanted to go, he was the one who dropped everything and met me in DC. When, I, my, when my girlfriend broke up with me three weeks before we were supposed to see the revivalist for three nights in New Orleans during New Year's, he dropped everything and stayed with me in the romantic Airbnb I had already booked. <laughs> That third night of concerts was New Year's Eve, and he was probably the drunkest person <laughs> in New Orleans on New Year's. <laughs> Even as late as three weeks ago, when I wanted to learn how to tie a full Windsor knot for my wedding instead of a half Windsor, I called him to tell him it was his fatherly duty to teach me. He didn't know either. So he watched a YouTube video <laughs> to learn, and then he taught me. I told him I wanted my tie to look so good that if we were on an episode of Family Feud, Steve Harvey would, be, Steve Harvey would take a second from the show to dap me up for looking so fresh. <laughs> he didn't really get what that meant, <laughs> but he knew it meant I wanted to look good for Carol. My dad and Carol built such an amazing relationship over the short time they knew each other. The four of us, including my mom, were in a group chat we kept active every single day. He always went out of his way to look up Portuguese translations so we can talk to her in her native language. They loved each other's sense of humor. The title in-law was quickly becoming erased by the relationship that they were developing because he treated her like a daughter, which of course means I came with so much unsolicited advice as well. <laughs> I could write an entire book of stories about my dad and what he meant to me, and I could talk here for another two hours. I won't do that. Instead, I'd like to read the letter he wrote me on my 18th birthday. It's filled with tips and advice I think everyone listening here would want to hear, and it's applicable to everybody, not just me. One second to pull it up. All right, I'll skip the parts. I mean, this made me tear up even before he died, so who knows what's gonna happen right now. I'll skip the parts that are directly for me. Every parent wants to give their child words of wisdom with that will help them thrive as an adult. For good and bad, you've already learned plenty from us and, you've already, and you're already a remarkable person, but I couldn't pass up this milestone without offering some thoughts and I wanted to help you transition to adulthood. So here they are, tips from Jeff Levine. One, don't take more than you need, clean up when you're done. Two, treat others as you wanna be treated, everyone deserves respect. Three, when you see someone in need, try to help. Four, be a man of your word. If you agree to something, do it. Five, emulate the good you see in others, not the bad. Six, listen to what others have to say. Even when you think you have the right answer, someone might have a better one. Seven, when you think someone is clearly wrong, try to understand why they think they're right. Eight, you don't always know what you don't know. Don't assume you know the whole story. Never stop learning. Nine, it's not what you say that's important. It's what other people hear. 10, every problem has a solution. Sometimes it takes time and effort to figure it out. 11, learn from your mistakes. Try to understand what went wrong and how to make it better next time. 12, it's okay to negotiate hard. Just remember both sides need to be satisfied if the deal su succeed over time. And the last one is 13, people who push themselves to do better are usually the ones who do better. And then he continues, you don't need to accomplish all of these things to succeed in life. And certainly you won't do the right thing every time. I certainly haven't, but, oops, but 
All of them are meaningful values and goals to strive for. And lastly, remember that sometimes it takes work to be happy. If you care about someone, make sure you tell them. Try to enjoy life as you go through it every day. And even in bad times, always find a way to laugh. I love you, I'm proud of you, and I look forward to seeing the wonderful adult you're about to become. P.S. Life is short, treat your body well. <laughs> All right, thank you, Brian. Uh, and now we have Jeff's sister, Melissa. Okay, so for a second, I'm gonna go off script, which when I started my radio career, which is now 72 million years ago, I was never able to do, but he taught me the ability to do that first I want to say to Anthony you were doing such a good job and I know you know how proud he would be of you seriously I can't seeing the man you've become and seeing how much you've meant the world to our family which you know but just seeing what you're Dude, this is the hardest gig of your life and you're nailing it and you're gonna be okay and I have no worries. Like, you got this. I just texted him. <laughs> Did you really? And, and because, can I tell the, and I'm not gonna, okay, there's so many stories, but anyway, Joanne just texted and they did the same exact thing, which is not surprising because that's what, that's what we did. You can tell him about my head getting stuck in the car door. <laughs> I could also tell about my head getting stuck in an uh, airline Gate, great, and Jeff sticking a jelly bean in his ear, but let's like, you know, <laughs> our gracious moments. We have time to share those. Also to all of you who've reached out to us. Being in radio for so many years, when someone in radio died, I would see air talent were all ego, fragile people. And I would see like people posting their resumes on the person who died wall and I would get a little disgusted. I fully expected to have that thought when it happened to my brother. And when I logged onto Facebook, I saw these amazing resumes, but what I realized was it wasn't about the poster. It was all these, not only careers, but lives. My brother created, influenced and created. Now I'm gonna go back on script. <laughs> Thanks Jeff for giving me the um, ability to do that. I have the unique ability to worry about every possibility and impossibility there could probably be in life, although 2020 is kind of making that seem not real, but like what if a 27,000 spider grows legs and sets fire? Anyway, I, I can imagine every worst case scenario there could be in the world. And it, as much of my life as, that I've spent worrying about things and planning for things, never in my wildest fears. I was riding a eulogy for my big brother and my hero, even a blip on the radar. In our lives, all any of us wants is to be fully seen. But what I've learned is, I know, but, but, but his granddaughter, two-year-old Juliana, is comforting me right now, which, legacy. In our lives, all any of us wants to do is be fully seen. But what I've learned in the past few days, which seems like decades, is that each of us is granted a unique individual sliver of a human being. And we think, because that's all we have the capacity to do, that that sliver is the entire human being. To make an analogy, and to use my brother and the best program director I ever had, words, no offense, Bob. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
inappropriate humor, waka waka, and sort of like sound effects <laughs> or what do you got to do? Um, I now need to paint a picture with my words. We go to the Grand Canyon and we spend a day, an hour, a week looking and loving at it from our own unique vantage point. At the end of the vacation, we walk away and we think that's the enormity of the Grand Canyon. I'm now flying over Jeff's life in a helicopter. The magnitude of it is breathtaking, humbling, and overwhelming. To mix metaphors, which is not a great radio thing, we're all given a tile, and when we step back and are granted the grace of seeing the entire mosaic, it is more beautiful and gratifying than words can express. Truth be told, I'm gonna keep talking forever, and I will to him, but not in this form. I want to express to Joanne the love of his life. To Joanne, his soulmate. And I know although she knows how much she meant to him. I spent so many years leaning on my big brother, hero's shoulder crying about myself. But when I had the capacity to be there for him, he would cry after a leukemia diagnosis about the fact that he thought he couldn't live life without her. I'm grasping for tiny miracles right now, but as strong as he was, maybe he actually couldn't live without her. To his daughter and first child, Jenny Sue, he had the unique capacity to be both pragmatic and sympathetic at the same time. He would express to me not only her struggles, but the internal beauty and strength she has that he recognized that she was not ready to see. His whisper, dear Jenny Sue, was that someday not only she recognizes who she is, but can step into who she was born to be. To his son and doppelganger, Brian, from the day you were born, he saw so much potential in you and literally felt your pain during your breast. <laughs> Not breasts for everyone, I'm mumbling bris. <laughs> Thank you, family. And while I couldn't be there because I was living in London, he wrote me a letter saying he never knew he could feel so much pain for another human being. He felt your physical pain and emotional pain always. To our dad. To our daddy. And so three days ago, we would always laugh at the fact that maybe by the age you can get into a retirement community, we should not be calling you guys mommy and daddy. And then we're like, are we kidding? We're always going to call them mommy and daddy. All we ever wanted is for you to be and we And we know you are. He credits you fully for being the male role model in his life and for making him the beautiful human being that he was. Yeah. And to our dearest mommy, who not only brought us into the world, not only was he thankful for the life that you created us, but he mourned the loss of the creative outlet that he thought you gave up to be our parent. On our very many drunken 3 a.m. seven hour phone conversations, he would say to me, you know, mommy was meant to be a flower child and I feel so bad that she didn't get to see that. And I expressed to him that she wouldn't have traded the job title for anything else in the world. We stand now as a family at a crossroads and we have two paths in front of us. We could realize how fragile life is and curl into a fetal position and be victims and wanna die. Or we could realize how precious life is and grasp every gossamer moment and realize the immensity and beauty of life and that is thanks to you.
Okay, thank you to uh, Aunt Missy. Uh, and now someone who worked with Jeff at both BAB, <clears throat> pardon me, and Newsday, a person he developed a special relationship with, Mr. Paul Fleischman. Thank you, Greg. And just a few minutes ago, listening to Brian, um, Brian, you know, Carrie and I watched you grow up. And now as a man, I see a lot of your dad in you. And that's a beautiful thing. With, I'm looking at the screen, there's so many different people and people who knew Jeff in so many different ways. I think everybody on this Zoom call has one thing in common. If we asked every single person here to make up their top 10 or even top five list of remarkable people that they've known and based on qualities like, like brains and talent and the heart, I guarantee Jeff would be on every one of those lists. I, I admit I'm still having trouble wrapping my arms around this and accepting the fact that this happened. And at the same time, I'm trying hard to use a lot of my energy to, uh, to bring back some memories of, of the times uh, that I spent with Jeff over the years. Uh, I met Jeff 26 years ago when I, uh, I first got to WBAB. And I remember my, one of my first impressions, he reminded me of that character Miles on um, uh, Murphy Brown. And once I got to know Jeff, and I got to know him very quickly at work, he was so smart and so creative. He had ideas by the thousands. Jeff always had this amazing energy. He was kind of like a tornado at work, just constantly swirling and twirling and coming up with great ideas. Uh, and he was a good guy. He cared about people. He cared about the people he worked with. He cared about listeners. Uh, and uh, his character really came through. And there were times, uh, Joanne, I don't know if you knew this, but Jeff could be a pain in the ass. And I mean that in, a, in mostly a good way because Jeff always challenged the rest of us. Uh, after WBAB, when I, when I went to Newsday, we needed a director of marketing and Jeff was clearly the right guy for that job. Uh, and what was interesting was even though Jeff had spent his whole career and really most of his life as what you would call a radio guy, uh, it turned out he wasn't just a radio guy. He, he seamlessly transitioned to this new job in a new world, in a new medium. And it turned out he was, he was more of a media guy. He loved communicating, he loved marketing, and it didn't matter what medium, whether it was television, or newspapers or radio or or the internet and I think about back at this is back in the 1990s uh, Jeff understood the technology and the functionality and the potential of the internet like nobody else did uh, and once again at Newsday the ideas kept coming and he really flourished and what was interesting was I watched him become a big corporate executive. I don't know if we ever could have predicted years before that, that Jeff would become uh, the quintessential successful corporate executive. The Tribune Company identified his, uh, his talents and his potential and his value. And he ended up uh, getting the job as a vice president at the South Florida Sun Sentinel. And then on, on to Hartford, and Jeff was always, he was an innovator and again, challenged people around him. And uh, through those years, I got to know Jeff at work and I got to know the work Jeff and the professional Jeff. And then when our careers sort of uh, moved in di different directions, that's when I really became lucky because I got to know, I got to know Jeff as a friend and Ka Carrie and I got to know Jeff and Joanne as friends. And even though we lived in different parts of the world, 
anytime Jeff and Joanne were in New York or anytime Carrie and I were in Florida, we would figure out how to, uh, how to get together. And uh, it was like we had never uh, been apart. Uh, we could talk for hours and, um, and really enjoy and appreciate the time we spent together. And getting to know Jeff as a friend was even better and more rewarding for me personally than getting to know him at work. And you folks all know Jeff, Jeff was fun and he was funny and he truly cared. And then the word passion comes to mind. He was always so passionate about being a good parent and being a good husband and being a good son and brother and being a friend and especially being, being a dad and then most recently being, being a grandpa. Uh, I'm heart heartbroken that Jeff's gone. And at the same time, I'm grateful for all, all of what he taught me. I learned so much from Jeff. And I'm grateful for so many really, really cool adventures that we had. So Jeff, you enriched my life in many ways. I'll miss you. Love you. God bless. All right, thank you, Paul. Uh, and now we will bring, be bringing back um, Jeff's sister, Melissa, as she will be reading something written by herself uh, and Jeff's dad, uh, Ira. So I'm going to lean on Jeff's son, Brian, right now, which um, physically and emotionally, which I know he would be so proud of. We're now reading my dad's message to Jeff. I don't know how many of you know that like he liked the Beatles and like John Lennon was like, kind of a cool guy to him, but close your eyes, have no fear. The monster's gone. Your daddy's here, a beautiful boy. It seems odd to hear a 50 year old man describe in this way. Jeff was, still is, and will always be our beautiful boy. Jeff was a beautiful boy when at two years old, he paced back and forth with a portable radio on his shoulder, like a mini boom box, probably before boom boxes were even, <laughs> even invented, listening to music. Jeff was five when after he learned to read, he may have become the youngest plagiarist in history. <laughs> when he rewrote Fun with Dick and Jean, I, I gotta say, I, I, read, I read what my dad wrote, but now I'm reading it for the first time. And it, <laughs> I'm enjoying it, you know, in a crazy way. <laughs> Fun with Dick and Jane by changing all the characters' names, but no copy. <laughs> so it was like Fun with Bob and Mary. <laughs> That's what it was. Probably Jewish names, though, like Fun with Irving and Selma so, or whatever. Okay. He was a beautiful boy when at six, his great grandmother was dying and he wanted to come along to see her. And he was told, Grandma won't know you, who you are. And he responded, but I will know her. He was a beautiful boy, went under the pen name Wanda the Tooth Fairy. <laughs> he wrote a letter to his baby sister and left it under her pillow, telling her to believe in the Tooth Fairy, even if others say it isn't so. Jeff was always our beautiful boy because he cared deeply about people, his family, his community, his country, and causes like justice and right and wrong, human dignity and human decency. Jeff was my beautiful boy when I adopted him when he was 37 years old. <laughs> Jeff was the brightest, hardest working and most supportive person one could hope to know. He worried about and spent hours helping his wife, his daughter, his son, his sister, his aging parents, his friends and his community. 
I guess you could have predicted Jeff's tra trajectory at an early age. A two-year-old with his radio. A six-year-old having his grandmother type up news stories and menus on his toy typewriter. A 12-year-old with a pirate radio station consistent of an old Vulcan sack. <laughs> Vulcan sack. Any of us know what that means? No. Tape recorder, some wires and speakers running to his friend's house next door, and a four-year-old employee doing commercials for Mean Jeans. I interject. Not employee. I wasn't intern because, you know, money's tight. <laughs> <laughs> Being editor of his high school newspaper and winning a Newsday Alicia Patterson Award for Long Island High School editorial, oh, Long Island High School editorial, being accepted. Oh, he was editorial. okay. He was accepted to both Oswego and the Newhouse School at Syracuse, and with his choosing, he went to Oswego because it was state school and less expensive. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Being chosen with only six others to be in the first class of the Honors College at Oswego, and after four years, being the only one to drop out. He graduated cum laude at, from Oswego. Starting as a 15-year-old volunteer at a pirate radio station, which he heard for the first time while babysitting, where he worked for and with his lifelong friend to be Bob Buckman. Starting as an intern and leaving as a program director at WBAB. Changing careers to work with another lifelong friend, Paul Fleischman, to do marketing at Newsday. Becoming vice president at the Sun Sentinel in Fort Lauderdale and ultimate senior vice president at the Tribune Corp. When forced to leave Tribune, he again reinvented himself with the help of yet another lifelong friend, Mark Snyder. He created an advertising and marketing company to promote, to promote and grow local business. With no expertise in face-to-face -face sales, internet sales, bookkeeping, or business management, he single-handedly built a successful business to care for his family. We never once heard him feel sorry for himself about his circumstances, assuring us everything was all right. Realizing that because of health issues, life is too short and too precious to waste, Jeff decided to sell the business he built and spend more time with his family. He was able to enjoy years of sunrises in Pompano and sunsets in Nettles spend time with his life's love, partner and wife, holding hands, listening to music, and being there for each other. Jeff loved his family with all his heart and it showed every day. From taking Jenny as a little girl to his grandma and grandpas in Florida, to sharing with me how happy and proud Joanne, Jenny, and Brian made him. From feeling and stating that he had the best grandma in the world, to sharing the same feelings and pride he had about his mother and how much he loved her. Baking grandma's cookies were as much about spending time with his mother and sharing a loving moment as they were about remembering his grandma. And he the cookies. <laughs> Plus, he got some of grandma's cookies. <laughs> he spent hours on the phone with his daughter, Jenny, met and loved his granddaughter, Juliana, saw his son relocate and fall in love, meet the woman who was to be his wife and Jeff's daughter-in-law. Jeff sometimes, usually after some alcohol, would tell his mother and me how much we meant to him. We were all lucky that Jeff was, from time to time, able to reach out to people and tell them how much they meant to him. I hope he had some idea of how much he meant to so many. I used to end our daily phone conversations by asking Jeff if he wanted to talk to his mother, knowing full well he had already spent 15 plus minutes on the phone with her. I suspect his mother and I will have fond memories of those talks the rest of our lives. We just found out that Jeff was an organ donor. Someone will see two babies get heart valves and other strangers in need will have better lives. Through his selflessness, Jeff taught us how to be a beautiful man. Uh, all right, and now at this time, uh, Jeff's mother, Harriet. I would just like to share with you. <laughs> yeah. Maybe you'll kneel while you watch this. I don't know. There are three letters my son wrote to different people at different stages. As mentioned before about Melissa not believing in the tooth fairy. Well, this is the letter that he wrote to her. Dear Melissa Tepper. Mm -hmm. 
I do. I do know. I they must have asked them if they knew how to, Wanda, if you knew how to write. Yes, I do know how to write. However, I am not writing this by myself. Jeff had a terrible handwriting, so he typed it, even when he was young. I had my helpers write this for me. This is because I am very busy. Did you know that I had to pick up 648 teeth tonight? Actually, only I had to go to 646 houses. One kid got into a fight, so I had to pick, take them all off. And another lost three, oh, excuse me. And his brother lost three teeth, so I had to take them off the list. I do not believe in fighting and did not want to give him a big reward. You do not fight with your brother, do you? I hope not. I remember when he was a little boy, he had a lot of trouble losing his teeth. They just didn't want to come out. Your teeth seem to be want to come out. Because you are so brave and pulled it out by yourself and didn't cry, I am giving you a special surprise. But don't expect this. <laughs> <laughs> Don't expect this all the time because money like doesn't, doesn't grow, grow on trees, trees. you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's all for now. Love, Wanda the Tooth Fairy. P.S. Don't tell any of your friends about this. I don't want, I don't write to all of them and they might get jealous. You can tell your parents and brother and grandparents. Be good. And, and behave. And behave. <laughs> what you say another step. Yeah. And then I, apparently... Six years ago, my son wrote this letter to, to my brother, and I had not known about it. And this is what he wrote. You are the easiest person to be close to, but I wanted you to know how much I appreciate all that you have done for me. Don't think I don't appreciate how you were there after my mom's divorce, how you bought all the Beatle albums for me and everything else that you did. You were an integral part of my early childhood, and there are so many details I don't even specifically remember, but deep down, know how you are a part of it. I also have fond memories of you and, in quotes, A, we didn't like her, taking me to the old concert and the George Harrison concert, and so much more. Even if you never had children of your own, I hope you know that you were a father figure to me, and I will always be grateful for the things you added to my childhood. Now I would like to read just around Jeff's last birthday. This is what he sent to us. Sometimes you don't necessarily tell your parents all you've learned from them or all the reasons you respect them. In so many ways, your parents shape you into the person you become. Here are a few of the things I got from my parents. From my dad, how to MacGyver things, strange, way, strange ways to repair things around the house, or you never know when that random piece of wood will come in handy. The value of a strong work ethic. The importance of understanding history and the world around you. He can't figure that out right now, that's for sure, what's going on. How to read, I wasn't doing all that well until the teachers went on strike. The joy of teaching others, how to tell a, um, a appropriate and one inappropriate joke. And most, that's what he taught Brian. <laughs> and most of and the kids still got through school. And most important, how to be a real father to a stepchild. From my mom, how to MacGyver things, you can turn an old trunk into a lovely piece of furniture with a little effort. The importance of family, a love for creativity, courage. Not many women would have the courage to leave a bad marriage with a young child to raise. Encouragement, a concern for the well being of others, a positive attitude. This is a column <laughs> with intended readership of two, hopefully. I would read Jeff's columns. Dad wouldn't have bothered him. And it was like, okay, can both of you read this and you read so this. Wrote, or at least one and then one saying Telling together, the other, it's the not column. a column, just read it. It is, right. And then the last is from both of my parents. Fortitude, sticking with things until you get it right. 
a progressive open-minded belief system, spending money wisely, the importance of saving, and media gratification isn't as satisfying as waiting to get something special. Thank you. Okay, uh, so folks, uh, in lieu of flowers in these, uh, this weird time that we're in right now, we were thinking, uh, as I said, in lieu of flowers, please, please feel free to donate uh, to a democratic cause. Uh, Jeff would have definitely enjoyed that, whether it be Act Blue or the Demo Democratic National Committee or any of your local Democratic uh, senator, governor races. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable doing that, um, we would appreciate uh, possibly a donation to the American Heart Association. You can use Jeff's email, Jeff Levine, two, the number two, at gmail.com. Uh, we feel this would be, uh, and we feel the best way to honor him would be to be voting for Joe Biden uh, in this upcoming November election. Uh, and before I kick it off to Brian, I do just want to say that I uh, am truly honored with the um, amount of people and the people that are here uh, to have done this. And so I want to thank uh, Brian and all of you guys for allowing me to do this. And um, it was nice to see everyone, unfortunately, um, in these melancholy times, but Brian, go ahead. All right, before we end, I just wanted to thank everybody again for being here. I know it would mean so much to my dad. Um, it's kind of surreal that we have to do this over Zoom. Um, and even though you all can't be here physically with us, we know you are there all, all for us. Um, and we feel your love and your support. And I just wanted to thank you guys for my family. Um, Maybe it's a good thing that we have to do this Zoom thing because it, it doesn't even, none of this even feels real yet. So the fact that we're having a Zoom memorial just helps disassociate with what's happening right now. But thank you. I know I speak for everyone in my family when I say we really do appreciate the words and support everyone has given us over the last week or so. Have a good night, guys. <laughs>